I'm Cynthia James, and this network is about changing lives one woman at a time. Hello and welcome to Women Awakening. I'm your host, Cynthia James, and I love that I get to introduce you to fabulous women, women who are way showers, women who are change makers, women who have said, I'm going to take control of my life. And oh, and by the way, I'm going to make a difference in the lives of others. And so I do this every week. Every Friday, you get a new show, meet a new woman and get inspired. We are on all the platforms, iTunes, iHeart, Speaker, uh, Amazon, YouTube video. Just look for Women Awakening with Cynthia James and subscribe. Tell your friends, share the videos. We want as many women as possible to know about the fact that we live in a field of infinite possibilities and the world is waiting for us to bring more love, more compassion, more light. So um, you can also go to CynthiaJames.net. I have a lot of stuff at my website and you can sign up for my monthly newsletter and see some of the things that I'm offering. So today I'm excited to introduce you to a woman who um, we have been on a board together. <laughs> we have been in Africa together and she's an extraordinary being. Her name is Suzanne Ledecker and she's a what her bio says is she's a dynamic mother, philanthropist, speaker, and author with a passion for empowering women. She holds a master's degree in marriage and family counseling and a certificate in spiritual psychology. We will talk about that because we have that in common. Um, and she resides between Aspen, Colorado and Orlando, Florida. One of the things that I love about her is that she has a new memoir and it's called A Woman on Top, My Journey of Self-Discovery Through Love and Money. She says that her commitment is beyond words, that she promotes self-care and practices the nurturing of the mind, the body and the spirit. Suzanne, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for having me, Cynthia. Well, I want to start um, where you came from, because because it, it's an important part of your book. <laughs> where, how did you grow up? Where did you grow up? I grew up, Cynthia, in a small town, town named Ross, California, which is north of San Francisco, across the Golden Gate Bridge. And I grew up in a oh, pretty typical family. My father went to work. My mother stayed home. Uh, it was so far from normal after going through the process of writing this book. But I think a lot of people's childhood was not as normal. The first chapter of my book is called The Apple Doesn't Fall Far From the Tree. And when I first started writing it, I realized the importance of figuring out what apple orchard I came from. If some of my apples are rotten, maybe I need to get rid of them. Maybe I want to move to a peach grove. I don't know. Um, I think that by far out of the probably 50 people who have read this book so far, which for me was overwhelmingly successful in less than a month, um, maybe more than that, maybe 100 people, that the best feedback that I got was on the beginning parts because I was showing my really confusion over love and money. Like, it, I didn't know whether we were rich, whether we were poor. We were poor for a little while, then we were middle class, I guess. And then we became, my dad sold his company. And so looking back on it, I realized that how much those experiences as a child set me up for future, oh, difficulties sometimes. A lot of the things that I learned from my father were extremely important and served me. Sometimes people are like, wow, how do you know all that? because I was involved a little bit in his business and whatnot, but there was still a huge like connection between love and money. And if you were good, somebody offered to give you something. And if you weren't, they offered to take it away. So it was all these mixed messages. And so that's where it's touched my readers the most, where they're like, oh, either I grew up in that kind of situation or it's made me think about my childhood. Yes. Well, I love that. Uh, you're an only child? 
I have a brother and okay. I didn't bring him into it too much. We have some family conflict over money. <laughs> right. You know? Right. I mean, I was just talking to this man. This is a little off the point, but this man that was at my house, he works for me. Clearly, him and his girlfriend are doing okay, but not great. And uh, she just moved in with him. And she's like, I don't get it. You know, like I have to pay two thirds the rent. She only has to pay one third. And he added up how much she's on vacation once a month, which means three months out of the year she's not working. He's like, I just don't get how this works. So I don't care who you are or what your financial position is. Love and money, especially when you start moving in or getting married and in the beginning, like who pays, what's supposed to happen. It's 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 complicated, I think. Yeah, well, it is. And what you were speaking about with your brother, you know, family dynamics are interesting, whether it's about money or not. It's really True interesting. That. It's just, so so I, I want to, you know, have you always been a seeker? I mean, you know, you've got this degree, this master's degree. You got you went to the University of Santa Monica. So did I. With you. <laughs> so did you did you always feel like you wanted to know more? You wanted to be more connected to yourself? Well, this is a very interesting question because at 12, my mother decided because of the complications in our family that we should go to a shrink. So she found this guy, Dr. Jerry Jampolsky, who helped bring the Course of oh. Miracles into the world. Yeah. And my family was there to support that process and help pay for it. And my mother worked at the center for years. And I think uh, he married me and he's since dead, but he left a, a great legacy behind him. And uh, so at 12, that was my experience. Prior to that, I was busy playing kickball in the backyard and hide and seek and wasn't really home a lot. We cruised the neighborhood and did whatever we did. Um, but I think that that set a seed and I got a degree, an undergraduate degree in landscape architecture. And then I started working at the center myself, working with people who had weight uh, image issues, which I also have because that's why people get into this business because they, they have their own issues. That propelled me to go to graduate school, which in those days was a very odd school in San Francisco called the California Institute for Integral Studies. I thought it was so left wing until I got to the University of Santa Monica. And when I found out about that school, there were some people that I know in Aspen. I didn't know they went to USM, but I knew all of them had something that I wanted. And the day that I got the application to USM, I knew that it was somewhere I, I wanted to go. And that really propelled my spiritual adventures and journaling and all kinds of things and there's a point in my book i swear eight years into this whole process which took me 11 years years after i graduated from usm and i was like i can't believe every day i seem to practice i freeform ride i meditate i do everything and nothing is changing and then all of a sudden like, if you want to transform yourself, just write the story of your life and you, you will grow more than you could ever grow possibly in any therapy. And I know I have those degrees behind me. Um, sometimes therapy is appropriate, but writing your own story was definitely something that all of a sudden everything began to click. And even two out of my three children have told me, I think the other one feels the same, but he's never verbalized it. They say, you know, I'm a different person now than I was. And so my my one lesson and hope for everyone is, is that whatever you're doing, keep doing it, even if you don't think it's working. Sometimes going to the gym doesn't produce, you know, the weight loss, or whatever. And I was just listening to Atomic Habits by James Clear. What a great book um, about how to, you know, kind of keep working, keep going. Right. So, okay. Um, uh, first of all, um, I want you to hold up your book because oh, yes. <laughs> I want to, because I want to talk about this book. Oh, it's beautiful. Woman on That's top. beautiful. And I almost did this whole thing myself because I, I stole from my son-in-law the, the writing up the side. And this is actually, could not find a silhouette because I wanted it to be me, but not right. me. 
And I took all these pictures and we created this and I came up with these special colors that mean a lot. And then somebody gave me this really soft, beautiful book. And I was like, that's it. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And so, ladies, if you're listening, um, we're going to tell you where to get the book. But if you're on YouTube, you've already seen it. It's gorgeous. So I want to I want to talk about how your life changed. You know, um, so. There's a moment where there's a tragedy in the family and. All of a sudden you have a lot of money. Talk to us about that. Yeah, it was. Well, yes, it was from my parents dying. And my my father was an entrepreneur and was apparently worth quite a bit of money because he filled out little pieces of paper his whole life that I found scattered through his files. I was like, this man was obsessed by how much money he made. I don't think it was for the money. I think that he was trying to prove to his family of origin that he was okay. So it was a small family run business by my started by my grandfather in the freight forwarding business in San Francisco. So they were running goods to Asia back, I don't know, back in the early 1900s. My father took over the company because he saw this, this, this vision that he couldn't let go of how successful it can be. The family saw it as he was trading in love for money. So there was another an example, a very clear one, where all of a sudden I was very close to my cousins and then nothing we weren't allowed to talk about it. So that was kind of upsetting. But, uh, you know, he had this, he lost all the money he made because he got a very bad Alzheimer's and just did very silly stuff, which I do talk about in my book. Um, But he managed to have this life insurance policy, which really, honestly, Cynthia, until the day there were checks arrived by regular mail, ridiculous, uh, I never knew whether it was going to come or whether it wasn't. And the day it came was the day I said, okay, I can support myself. I was a single parent at that time and my three children. And I don't have to worry about providing for them for college and doing all that. I did not inherit a ton of money, but I inherited a great deal more than than most people on the planet have, um, which set me up for just continue with your point, when I inherited the money, it was like I'd won the lottery or sold my company or divorced and all of a sudden somebody plopped a lot of money into my lap, more than I had ever had, for sure. And I didn't know how to handle it. I challenged anybody. I talk to people all the time and they're like, can't wait to win the lottery. This is what I'm going to do. Well, we know from fact that most lotteries, most lottery winners lose all the money the families are divorced, um, the, broken up, and or they kill themselves. That's right. That's so right. I felt like I was a lottery winner, and I felt a lot of guilt and shame over being the chosen one. And I hung around a lot of just people that didn't necessarily have a lot because they're my friends. And it, you know, and especially it impacted my relationship with boyfriends. And everybody said to me, just one second, over and over again, well, the only reason they're there is for the money. And, I, you know, after a while, I got kind of sick hearing that because I was like, do I not bring anything else to the table except for finances? So I really had to overcome that. And, you know, and that outer journey of trying to figure out how to date men and be a breadwinner, because I was, because I did quite well with it. Um, and having more money, how to stand up and be an empowered, authentically empowered female around that and balance out the relationships. And then all of a sudden, one day something happened and I experimented and I said, maybe we shouldn't take all of this so personally, you know, whatever, Uh whatever the crisis was, whatever the thing was that I, you know, I see people doing it all the time and I have so much empathy for them. So I'm like, oh my God, that just creates more messes that you have to clean up. Once I start started, you know, I always go water over a duck's back as best you can. Sometimes you get triggered right. and you go there, but it's been amazing to let that go. Well, there's a lot to unpack here. I mean, you said a lot. And so I, I there's a couple things I want to, I, I want to, talk about first I want to talk about the fact that for the most part nobody really says to women this is how you handle money this is how you manage money 
whether you're making it, whether it comes from an inheritance, whatever, you know, and, and so did you get support to learn how to manage money or did, what, or did you kind of like stumble and fumble around until you got clearer? Well, I mean, of course, there's some stumbling and falling, but I, I had the skill set. I'm not skilled enough to be your secretary or put together this this social media <laughs> thing that you're doing right here, podcast. But I did know a lot from my father, so it wasn't the problem. Oh, yes, it was sometimes handling where to spend. Did I overspend? Did I raise my hand in auctions, buy a trip to France? And then I was, you know, whatever. I was always giving to someone because I'm a service person, right? But I think that the the place where I really didn't have any guidance, and I don't think, I talk to a lot of young people and all parents think that they have it all figured out. I am here to tell you they for surely don't. You know, I've interviewed girls at Brown who I had the special opportunity of spending some time with. And I said, well, how do you guys handle being very smart, being very successful in their school life, having a boyfriend? They're like, we don't. We can't. It doesn't work. I've talked to young girls that came from a lot of money, but the parents are not supporting them. But then the boyfriend always thinks that, you know, it's hidden away in the closet is daddy's secret chest of gold. And it doesn't it doesn't really go so well. So I think that the inherent problems in this are much greater than learning how to deal with the money, although that's entirely important. But it's how, knowing how to personally take responsibility for who you are, turn your, I I thought I had, believe it or not, I thought that this was, a, 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 you know, like something that was bad. I, I, at times I wanted to give it away. I was like, right. I just want to be like everyone else. And I didn't feel like everyone else. So something shifted in there at some point where I had to make a choice to say, okay, fake it till you make it. You are so lucky. This is such an asset. You wouldn't, like I didn't, I don't have an MBA or a wealth degree management, or you know, I'm not a psychiatrist and around love. All I know is from my personal experience that I realized this. My whole life was designed to write this book. And you, you, you asked me questions before uh, when you sent me your ideas about that. Was it scary? Um, what was what? What was um, what were your struggles along the way? telling my truth and right. one of my biggest things is to help and support women in being honest especially when they start a new relationship about acting with integrity about who you are and what you're what what you don't like um because Man. we're so afraid they're gonna run away yes they're not gonna run away they're gonna come closer i promise you well what i love about this is um um that you 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 found your way you navigated your way to to get to where you are today and i i just want to reiterate the importance of writing your story whether it becomes a book or not there's yes. something extraordinary about you know writing your my last book you know i think i cried through 90% of the writing cuz <laughs> it was so it was like oh man i did that right but but here's the thing i want to say about you um, telling the truth. So in your relationships, because, you know, there have been relationships and I know people say, well, they're there for the money, but, you know, I really believe everything's about the great teachers that come into our life. But, but what is the biggest lesson you've learned about being your authentic self in a relationship and, and what it brings to you? Well, I think that those would be very personal questions. My, my answers would be, you know, believe it or not, jealousy was a difficult one for me. I had three back-to-back -back kind of relationships with semi-pro athletes. Either they had been to the Olympics or they were whatever, and they were really hot, smoking hot. <laughs> Most of them younger than I am and entirely broke. Um, but I didn't want to... You know, sometimes I guess they, they, I felt threatened. I had somebody do this to me in reverse last night where he was clearly had a moment where he was feeling jealous. And I was like, and it's no problem. You know, people do it. But the less you can 
be jealous over anybody or anything, or certainly not being afraid that your boyfriend, if he's there, trust that he's there because he wants to be there, you know, and, um, and really not taking things person personally and personal responsibility are the key takeaways that I can say. Now, how you get there, there's lots of ways to get there. But what I tried to do in this book, and it was scary as all can be, um, is share my story of don't do this. <laughs> but you might want to consider this because this is a better path because I talk to women all over the world just in conversations like this. I love this. And there's just a lot of, you know, similar stories. Um, and people, women so far, we're waiting for men to change. We're going to be waiting a very, very long time. <laughs> that is not going to happen, ladies. So, you know, it's it's time for us to stand up in our unique, if we want equal pay, because if I pulled everybody in this audience, everybody that watches YouTube, 99.5% of them would say, I believe in equal pay for an equal job done by a woman. Well, if 99, there would be the 0.5 holdout that would say, I like my woman naked in the kitchen in the bedroom. <laughs> but if 99.5% of us believe it, and it's not happening, my only conclusion that I've made over the last 11 years is somebody's lying. You know, and I think a lot of it falls, I hate to say it, women, but a lot of it is naturally fallen on our shoulders to... You know, because we're caregivers. If you go back over time, like women have only been able to vote since 1960s. My God, we've been on the planet for hundreds of years doing it exactly a different way. And now everyone's like, new normal. Okay, you guys got it. Right. This is not, hasn't been enough time. Things can change in an instant, but there hasn't been enough female role models. Now, Cynthia, I look at you because you're doing this as a female role model. For other women and you know but there was very few that we grew up with eleanor roosevelt right. you know there, there's a few there's a handful of very successful oprah winfrey certainly is one of my favorite people um many people that have many women that have done amazing but it's a shift yeah it's a um time magazine just had um Taylor Swift is the person of the year. She's 33 years old. Yeah. And but, but what I love about what you're saying is, and I'm going to say this to you ladies, there's not a ton of models, but there are models. Look at them, study them, understand what they're doing and how they're doing it and see if it can apply to any area of your life. Because the more of us that heal, the more of us that change and transform the larger that number gets and the old paradigms, you know, crumbles. So Suzanne, um, I'm very proud of you for doing this book. I mean, um, tell people how they can get your book, how they can get in touch with you. Uh, well, my book was published on Amazon and through uh, Instaspark, with Ingram Spark. Sorry, I don't like to remember that name. Um, so it is available in your local bookstore if you ask for it. Hopefully it will be in all local bookstores eventually, but you can go to Amazon and put in the title, A Woman on Top, My Journey of Self-Discovery Through Love and Money, or you can put in my name, which is S-U-Z-A-N-N-E, all smaller letters, no space, my last name, which is Lydecker, L-E-Y-D-E-C-K-E-R. And it will take you directly to a page. And if you scroll down before you buy, I, I love the hardcover, by the way. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's amazing. And I am shooting to make an audible version in February. But if you scroll down and read some of the reviews on this book, I every day I'm blown away by what people have to say. And, you know, some of them could be not telling the truth because some of them are my friends. But it, overwhelmingly, it's been received quite well. Yeah. Or you can go to my website, which is same, SuzanneLidecker.com, and sign up to get notified or uh, sign up for to receive a newsletter, and we can get to you, help you get there that way. And That's it would be beautiful. really great. And if listen, anybody that reads this book and wants to share back with me how it touched them, that would be incredible because I know my story. I want to hear yours. I want to have a conversation. 
love it okay ladies you heard it go to amazon go to her website get the book you know it's really important for us to support one another for us to you know because it takes a great deal of courage to create and so the more that we can support one another the better so suzanne i ask the same last question of every guest this show is called women awakening what do you think is the most important thing about women awakening at this moment on the planet well, I think that finding your purpose and passion is super important. I talk to more people on the planet, men and women, and I'm like, what's your passion? I don't know. Now, you can live life without a passion but and a purpose, but I think that that is, it makes what you're doing, it, it narrows down your task to making sure that you're, the things that you're doing are in line with your purpose and passion. And sometimes, we have to vacuum or pay the bills or whatever, but just do it as much love as you can. And really, I'll go back to my other point, which is take personal responsibility. Never blame anybody for anything. It, it's we're all you said it. We're all here to support one enough and nobody shows up in anybody's life for no reason. It's just Absolutely. I don't believe. And that, you know, that's kind of the greatest gift that I got out of it, that I recognize that. Without without some hardship and without some difficult times, how are you going to get to the good stuff? You won't even know it's there. Right. So it's it's all just a journey, and it's you know it's a wonderful journey. And embrace the things that are hard, and know that they they're meant for some reason for your growth. Absolutely. So uh, I want to end this segment with you bef before I say goodbye to the ladies. You got a quote that came to you today. I do. And and so, so I would love for you to share it. Thank you. I'm going to have to read it off my computer. So That's screen, okay. So sorry. This is by John Roger, who was the founder of the University of Santa Monica and has long since passed. But uh, I receive his quotes daily and I love them. This Just 15 minutes before I got in this call, this is what came up. The finish line is not the line ahead of you. It is the line you see as you cross it. Do you stop the second you cross it? Not necessarily. The momentum of finishing a task in devotion may propel you further than your original intentions. The result of that can be surprising rewards that are beyond your expectations. And that is certainly, I think you spoke to this early too, certainly, like I had no idea. I had for my level of just writing a book, the most unbelievable response in my community in Aspen, Colorado. I mean, people came out of the woodwork to support me and show up for a book launch and a reading and a, and a, and a party to celebrate everyone's success afterwards. And my original intentions were not to have a website and to not, you know, do speaking engagements. I just wanted to write a book and get it out in the world. But that's not what's happening. It's, it's being a snowball. And actually, I'm getting more energy. Sometimes a little challenging to keep up with the emails, but I'm finding I have more energy now that it's more focused into my purpose and passion, which has become very clear. So, well, Suzanne, thank you so much. Thank you for having the courage to write the book and for being willing to just put one step in front of the other, you know, because the, the birthing of the book was just the beginning. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia, and love to all of you. So, ladies, I say the same thing to you in a different form every week. You know, hey, this is your time. This is your moment. You know, there is nothing to wait for. There's no, it's going to come when. How about now? Bring your light. Bring your love. Bring your peace. You know, I love what John Rogers said. You know, keep going keep moving, move in the direction of your dreams, connect to that passion and power that live within you. I'm grateful to be with you. I'm grateful to share the women uh, on this planet who are doing things and can remind you of how fabulous you are. Thanks for being here. See you next time. <music>